Praise the Lord, everyone. This is Pastor Woodfield coming to you on the Sunday, November 30th, 2014, welcoming you to our weekly broadcast of Faith, Hope, and Love Ministries and Retreat Services International. As always, we're so appreciative of you for taking time out of your busy schedule to watch us on social media. Today, we're going to go into the book of Ezekiel, the 10th, the 14th, or the 10th chapter, excuse me, and the 14th verse, and we're going to be looking at just one verse there today. So let us pray before we go into the word of the Lord. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus Christ for this your day. We thank you for your many manifold blessings towards us. And God, we pray that as we go into your word, that you would bless your people immensely. Send your anointing that makes teaching as well as ministry of your word profitable to each and every hearer. We pray that this word will dislodge ancient things and curses and things that have gone on in, in your people's lives and our lives for generations, and that God by it, that we will be free to walk in the kingdom as the sons of God in the pure image of Jesus Christ. Now, God bless us as we go into your word. In Jesus' great name, we pray. Amen and amen. Praise the Lord. I just want to mention before we go into the word of the Lord to join Guiding Light's prayer line ministry out of Wilmington, North Carolina under the leadership of Apostle Angela Bannerman and Pastor Michael Bannerman and the visionaries of that ministry is Minister Dion Bannerman and his lovely wife, Sister Maya Bannerman. Their prayer line number is 910705 Eight five five five, and they have prayer around the clock, uh, starting at three a.m. now, which is due three a.m., six a.m., nine a.m., twelve noon, three p.m., six p.m., nine p.m., and again at midnight. And this occurs seven days a week with multiple speakers uh, from around the country, men and women that are able and well equipped to provide and teach and instruct on the word of the Lord, and yours truly is featured on Wednesday evenings at 9 p.m. So join us and be blessed by the word of the Lord unto you. Again, that number is 910-705-8555. And be a blessing to the Godding Light family and ministry. Going into the word of of the Lord. Ezekiel, the 10th chapter, verses 14, uh, actually verse 14 only, and we've already prayed and consecrated the word of the Lord. And it says, and everyone had four faces. We're talking today about the ever-changing faces of man, the ever-changing faces of of man. And let me just read that verse once again in its entirety. And everyone had four faces. The first face was the face of a cherub. And the second face was the face of a man. And the third face of a lion. And the fourth face of an eagle. And today we're looking at the ever changing faces of men of mankind. So we're not only just talking about man gender, we're talking about man humanity, which comprises both male and female. And too often in our life and in our society, we see people that are ever changing in their position or their stances or they're compromising or they're not walking according to the true person that God has created them to be. We are fearfully and wonderfully made according to the book of Psalms. And the thing is we have to accept and acknowledge the fact that we are made as an individual, though we may be a part of a family and we may have some inherent traits and characteristics that are passed down from our parents, from the lineage, from our bloodline, and those things have a tendency to be a part of our own lives. But the thing is, is that we must remain true to who we are as an individual. God has fearfully and wonderfully created us to be in his image. And if we're seeking to take on anyone else's persona or image, we should be seeking God to be conformed to his image. So the ever-changing faces of man, our faces actually shows 
our true self. There is no way that we can hide from who we truly are. And our faces and our body language and our posture, our wording, our suggestions, and our eyes and the things that we hear all equate to the person that we are. And our faces actually expose more about us than any part of our body or our human being or our mentalities or our thought processes. Although we think that we may be hiding certain things, our countenance of our faces, usually, especially to someone that is very spiritual, that walks with the Lord and is very discernful, can pick up those things that are going on in each and every one of our lives. They are, are able to see exactly what it is that is going on, whether we think they should see it or not. God has a way of showing and revealing and exposing things that we never thought he would. But because of his mercy, his love, and his grace towards his children, he always reveals to someone what is going on on the inside of his children. So our true faces shows our true self. The person we allow our family, there are faces that we only allow our family members to see. There are only certain people that are allowed to see certain things about our lives and everything else remains cloak from the vast majority of society and from people. We only reveal those things that we wish to reveal. The one, Even to the ones that are closest to us, our closest friends, may not see everything that our family member sees. And then again, if you're married, there are things that your spouse may see that no one else sees. And there may be things that you even cloak and hide purposefully from your spouse, whether you're doing it to be brazen or whether you're doing it to, as a protective measure or whether you're doing it because you don't want to hurt someone or because you don't want to be hurt. And there are some things from your past that you don't want to show in your face. And even sometimes when people say different things that strike a chord, our facial expressions usually react. There are sometimes we get a rise out of certain people by saying certain things. Sometimes people have told me if they cough or hear someone cough a certain way, people that have been abused or raped, that they hear a man cough or say a certain thing, it brings back a flood of memories and you can see that this happiness or that pain in their facial expressions. Sometimes we even hide ourselves from our work. We have a work face that we put on when we're at work. We have a game face that we put on when we're involved in playing games. And some of us love to manipulate people with the games that we play. And sometimes even when we're playing games uh, such as Monopoly or things of that nature, it brings out another level of us, a competitive person. When we are walking in competition and we love competing with people and we love winning. You can see people when they win, the happiness on their face. You can see people that lose at a game, although it is just a game. When they lose, they some people are just sore losers and they take it hard and they become vindictive. There are faces that we expose to the general public at large that everyone is privy to see that. And there's a more guarded face and a more guarded facial expression. There's also the face of sin and shamefulness when we have walked in obvious sins or when we're caught or when we're called on the carpet or even that brazenness look when we're refusing to believe or accept that someone has caught us in our wrongdoing, then the face of justification takes over. We try to justify our actions. We try to say that we didn't do a certain thing or we didn't say that. We also take on the face of distrust or disbelief. Even in relationships when you are so hurt that you don't believe a person or you know that you caught the person and you don't believe what they're saying to you. There is disdain that comes across in the facial expression. There are some times when we're in deep contemplation and people can see the spirit of, of the depths 
of the level of contemplation that we're in. When we're sick and we're in agony, people can see the agony or the pain that is on our face and comes across in our continents. You see people that are worried and that comes across in their facial expressions. You see people that are very sarcastic, even in their approach, in their life, and even their sarcasm when it comes to a person or things that they're dealing with and how they're communicating with people. Sometimes people are sarcastic only jokingly, and they only mean it as a joke because they have a comfort level with the person to whom they're joking with, and that sarcasm is accepted because it's something that is communicated between the group of them or the two of them because of the level of respect that they have towards one another. But there's also people that function in sarcasm because of hurt that they have been through and they don't want to accept or embrace the truthfulness of what people are saying to them. So they become rather sarcastic in their approach. They're not trying to be humorous. They're trying to wound and hurt people with their level of sarcasm. There are people that are lighthearted, and you can see the lightheartedness in their face and in their countenance. When they're being lighthearted, you can see people that are truly, genuinely happy, and it shows forth in their face. You can tell people that are serious by the countenance of their face, and often people read seriousness for people being upset, and upset shows in the facial expressions as well. Sometimes they could they could be the same as the one or the other, but sometimes people could be happy in their heart, but because they are a serious person, their facial expression shows that they are a serious individual, or they may be seriously thinking about something that is going on that they may need to handle or address. It does not mean that something is wrong with inside of their heart. There is also the facial expression of those that are in the or that are disgusted at certain situations or because of the of a discussion that they may have had with someone and that thing is still yet heavily on their minds and they're thinking about that. There is also the facial expression of someone who is lonely that is experiencing gross loneliness, the pain of loneliness, the pain of being separated, of not being in communication with someone, the pain of disappointment, the pain of agony, not that they want to walk in that agony, it's just a situation that has come upon them that has caused them to be able to, or caused them to walk in this particular area. But God does not want them to walk in that pain of loneliness. That's why the scriptures say that it's not good for a man to be alone. God understands that loneliness, isolation, and separation keeps us from communicating with our brothers and our sisters and even from walking in the pureness and the truthfulness of what God wants us to walk in. That's why the scriptures say that we should not that we should not separate ourselves from the body of spirit-filled believers, seeing that the days are evil. In other words, don't be lonely when it comes to your walk with the Lord. God wants us to walk with one with another, to despise not the assembling of yourselves together, seeing that the days are evil. He wants you to draw strength. And when we see the loneliness in your continents, God wants that loneliness to be done away with because, again, he said that it's not good for man as well as woman to be alone. And if someone tells you that it's good for you to be alone other than God himself for the seasons of your life that he wishes for you to be alone so that you can have one-on-one -on -one fellowship, but if you fully understand God, you are never alone. Even when you think that you are alone, God is ever present with you. He is always there. Tune in bi-weekly on social media to hear the word of the Lord through Pastor Woodfield. Join us and be empowered by the word of the Lord unto you.
There's even the, the continence or the facial expression of one who was hurt and has been broken by life circumstances, by persons that have come into their lives and have hurt them by various foul acts of indecency, of disrespect, of dishonor, by abuse physically and verbally, by lying on folks and talking about their names and their reputations and dragging them through the mud and causing them to go into a state of despair and despondency. Deep despair and deep despondency, anger and bitterness and things that come over their lives by things that have been inflicted or injected into their lives that they never once asked for. The cruelty of per people's actions and their responses and how they treat one unfairly. There is also the continence of the facial expression of being upset, whether rightfully or wrongfully. There is also fearfulness that strikes people because of things that causes fear in their hearts. There is also rebelliousness, the, the stern, obstinate look of rebelliousness that comes from a person who has not yielded or surrendered themselves to be submissive. And there's also the face of submissiveness. But rebelliousness, the Bible says, is as the sin of witchcraft. And we must learn to release the spirit of rebelliousness. Now, it's one thing to rebel against ill and evil and iniquity and sin by saying, I will not walk according to that way. I will walk according to the laws of God. That is a type of thing that God honors. But when we're rebellious against the ways of God and the laws of the land that are righteous and against those that have rule over us, then we have become a vile vessel in the very presence and the eyesight of God. And God wants us to be healed and delivered and set free from the spirit that brings that bondage to rebelliousness. The weightiness and the chains of that sinful nature and that sinful desire that keeps us separated from the very face of God, because he sees rebelliousness in our faces, and he cannot look upon sinfulness. So God despises rebelliousness, because that was the very thing that led to Lucifer's desire to usurp his authority over God was his rebelliousness and taking a third of heaven with him, being cast out of the holy mountain of God as profane. We have to be very careful that we're not walking in the face of rebelliousness and that rebelliousness is even seen or shown on our faces or in our hearts or in our souls or even in our spirit, not even in our flesh vacate the camp of rebelliousness and submit yourself under the almighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due season. There is also the face of the faithless, people that have no faith, no belief in the true and the living God. They don't have a desire to even be faithful towards him. They are faithless. They're faithless for multiple reasons. One, they're saved, but their faith is weak. Either they're saved and they're not building up themselves in their most holy faith by praying in the spirit. Or they're just faithless. They have no desire to believe in God whatsoever. And they have no desire to come to God. They're ag agonistic or atheists in their beliefs. They have no desire 
There's also the despise, those that despise God, you or people, or their brothers or their sisters. They just have a, a just a, 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 a deep nature of hatred that is flowing around in their spirit, unchecked, unrestrained, not bridled in, but it's unchecked. Their despise is so bitter that it walks into anger. Even when persons come around them, they despise them that severely and that deeply. There is also the, there is also the facial expression of those that walk in carriage. How many of you know that God despises wimps, cowards? God walks with people who are courageous. Now, carriage takes on many different attributes. Carrot sometimes means that you're running full force in the face of the devil, devil and not or the enemy and not shrinking down. Sometimes carrot means that you may have to retreat for a season to regroup to come back to the battle. Jesus was full of carriage, but often Jesus would retreat to a solitary place to pray, to be restrengthened. There was nothing about him that was a wimp. If you listen to the things that Jesus said to the Pharisees, the Sadducees, even his own disciples and his own family, you find out that the only one that he had full respect for without saying anything to in a negative way was God. But understand, when he spoke into the lives of people, he had one intention and one desire to expose the ways of righteousness and to seed into their heart the right paths and to sow into the hearts of the wicked their own condemnation. But his true purpose was to show to all men the ways of life. And even when they rejected the ways of life. His words were still seated with the love of God, hoping that they would vacate their erroneous position and their doctrines of men that were degenerative of the mindset of God that they themselves have imposed and inflicted upon all humanity because they wanted con to control heaven's desire for humanity as opposed to submitting themselves to the ways of God. And Jesus was able to look in their faces and see that they were vipers, that they were ravenous wolves, not intent on submitting to the ways of God, but did set bent on following their own instructional doctrines that they created in their attempt to make even more the children of darkness the sons of men. And they had the nerve and the audacity to say that they were Abraham's seed and were never in bondage to any man. But Jesus had to make it clear to them that they still had the Egyptian mentality. You may be Abraham's seed, but in bondage you are still in indeed. Because you who made your life study the word of God do not understand that standing in your midst is the very one that you were waiting for. The Messiah, the Son of God. The chosen one, Jesus Christ, our Savior, Master, Redeemer, and Lord. The Word itself standing before you and you're challenging Him. But had you recognized your life studies, you would have still understood that the full embodiment of the Word was standing right there. In front of your face. Being beheld by your very eyes. Being heard by your ears. And speaking to you 
with his very mouth. That everything that he said out of his mouth was the word of God. Because he is still to this very day the word of God. You have the face of challenging. And are you for real face? We have that when we look at people and say, are you for real? Seriously, are you for real? And sometimes we have that look by saying back to the person, I am for real. We have a face of honor or dignity. And there are times that God allows us to have a face of honor and dignity where he allows us to look distinguished, whether we open up our mouths or not. It is also God gives us the face of heroism. Look at David. David walked up to Goliath with a face of a hero. He was not going to be moved by this behemoth of a man. And if you look at the Apostle Paul, he was not fearful of what lie lay before him. But he was going to go to Rome because he was not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, was he understood it was the power of God unto salvation, to the Jew first and to the Gentile. And for that reason, he was willing to face death and to go. And his face would communicate, I am not afraid to die. Because he even came to the decision, it is better for me to depart, but it's also beneficial to you that I stay. But he got to the end of his life. He said, I have run the race. I have kept the faith. And now henceforth has laid up for me a crown of eternal life. How many of us can come to the end of our journeys and say, that I've done all that the Lord Jesus Christ has given unto me to do. There is also the face of unwavering faith and confidence in God. I will not take down. I will walk with God. Although you may not see where you're going, you're still walking with God in absolute faith. I choose to believe the eternal existence of God. And I choose to believe in the God that he is. And I choose to believe that God by faith will lead me and us to our destination while here on earth. And even to our final resting place with him. Even in the midst of all the struggles, even in the midst of all the disappointments, even in the midst of all the pains and all the setbacks and all the successes and all the accomplishments and all the accolades, we still choose to have an unwavering faith in God. Yes, we may still be falling into sinful things purposely and unpurposefully. But yet we still have a challenging belief in God that we will not fail. <coughs> Excuse me. That we will not fail him. But we will still trust and believe in the eternal God to secure us for all eternity. There is also the face of someone who is humble before God. Someone that is so humble that you could feel the humility walking out of them. They are not concerned about a title, a position. And they may be a person of great influence and a great title that God himself has bestowed upon them. But God often sees the humility. I tell people I'm not often concerned about a title. And if God has not given it to me, I'm not concerned with it. When you know who you are in God, you walk in humility. You walk based upon who God says you are. You're not concerned about the accolades of men. 
You're not concerned about being protected by men, but you know that God is your protection. You don't mind getting down and washing the feet of people because you know who you are in God. You don't mind becoming a servant because the Bible said that the greatest amongst you become your servant. Some way or another, we got this thing twisted. We think people should serve us instead of us serving them. Whenever God allows an open door for me to minister in, before I leave that sanctuary, I make sure that I talk and speak to everyone that is there. I shake their hands, and I'm not in a rush to leave. I take my time and bless the people of God, talk to them, pray for them, encourage them, motivate them. And I refuse to leave until God says it's time to leave. I'm going as a servant of the Lord. I'm not going to be served. I'm going as a servant of the Lord. And one of my friends who went with me this past March in ministry saw that. And he's told me, he said, William, I love that you do that. And I want you to continue to walk in it. I've never seen people do that. And spend the amount of time and walk around even to the smallest child to the oldest person. And when I come in, I don't come in with the intention or nor the desire to steal someone else's sheep. That is not in my heart. My heart is be a blessing to the servant of the Lord in that house that after I've left, that I've left that place in a much better state to enhance the servants of the Lord's life And that the people of God will be on fire for the Lord. And will be a better support to that particular ministry. You'll be surprised of how many people will not come to the altar. But they want somebody to talk to them one on one. And speak the words of faith into their lives. To encourage them. To motivate them. For someone to hear their story. And for someone to touch and agree with them face to face. Not taking on a false face. Not condemning them. But realizing where they are in their faith and in in the Lord. And seeing the concern, the hurt and the pain. And the agony that is on their faces. And seeing God himself move and lift that burden of concern off of their faces. You could even see someone that when they fully have repented, you could see the repentance in their faces. You could see people that are even timid and the timidity that is in their faces, the shyness and the embarrassment of being shy. And even the connectivity to people in their faces. You can see the face of those that are hungry naturally and spiritually. You can see the hunger in their faces. The face of those that are sick. There's the face of honesty. The face of a liar. The face of the deceptive. The face of the powerful. The face of those that have come out of prayer. And you can see the power of prayer resting on them and the lightness of their countenance when they have spent time in the very presence of the Lord. You can even see the face of the devil on people. And you can see when he's attempting to try to take them down. 
You could also see the face of someone who has been in the presence of the Lord, just as Moses, when he descended from the mountain, the people could see his face, that they had to cover it, veil it, because his face shone brilliantly, shined brilliantly. Our faces can be read by people in ways, and, and it's often a look into our mortal souls. People can often determine how we're feeling by looking at our faces. There are times that someone may look upon us and misread where we are mentally as well as emotionally and spiritually. There are times that even God causes certain things to happen in our facial expressions. There are too many times that even in ministry, I have seen people take on the facial expression or the persona of other people in ministry because they wanted to be just like them. I have two occasions where people, people that I know extremely well, won't go into much detail there, but one person I know, female in both cases, took on the persona of a well-known evangelist. There is another one, female, that want to be like another popular televangelist, female. And one Sunday morning when this person was preaching, I didn't see them, nor did I see God. But I saw the image and the facial expression while this person was preaching of this well-known tele-evangelist that is on seven days a week, sometimes multiple times a day. And I saw this person's heart, the person that was in my midst, heart was so desirous to be like this person that as they preached, I did not see them. I saw the persona of the televangelists on them. What a major tragedy when we, when we fail to walk in the uniqueness that God has given to each and every one of us. There is no desire in my heart to be like anybody else in ministry other than what God has called me to. When God has called you to a specific ministry, when he himself has called you to a specific ministry, listen, when he calls you first, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Let me go to that because I keep mentioning that. In Psalms, it says, Psalms 138, I believe it is, verse 14. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made, and your works are wonderful, and I know that full well. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. God never wants you or I to model ourselves off of anyone else. As a matter of fact, the scripture says this, that we should be conformed to the image of God. For those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. God wants us to walk in the uniqueness of who he created us to be. We are not designed to be like anyone else on the earth. Yes, you may sit under someone else. And under their tutelage, you will learn some certain inherent behaviors and verbiage and wordings and things. But God wants you to take all of that and allow him to mold it into your own image to be used by him for his glory. 
the way you speak, the way you dress, the way you carry yourself, the way you comb your hair or lack thereof. God wants you to be unique, forging your own footpaths, your own fingerprints as you go. He does not want you to be a clone of someone else on the earth. Yes, the mantle may be transferred to you and conferred upon you, but you still have to walk in the uniqueness of who God created you to be as an individual. Now go into the four faces of the creatures that's in Ezekiel, the 10th chapter, and the 14th verse. The first one was a cherub, a heavenly creature that walked in pure humility to worship God without fail and to honor the Lord's requests and his biddings without failure. The word of God is the only thing that moves them and reflects a heavenly, uncompromising nature of these angelic beings that they are submitted fully and completely to the full obedience to the sovereignty of God's kingdom. They're not influenced nor are they controlled by any other being but God himself. The first face God wants us to take on is a face of submission to his will, to heaven's doorways, pathways, and heaven's desire upon us. Second one was the face of a man. God never wants us to forget our humanity and the frailties of our lives. That we are always prone to error and sinfulness. But with his grace and his mercy, he empowers us, influences us to walk in deeper depths and higher heights and greater mercies in him. The third face was the face of a lion. He wants us to understand his maje- maje- majesty, his ma- that he is majestic, that he is all-powerful, that we are serving a royal God, that he is, walks in full dignity, leadership, and he commands respect from all of his creation. And all of his creation will ultimately reverence him. By choice or by force of choice. That he is flawless and that he is a conqueror. He subdues everything. The beasts of the field obey him and that he is com- he has complete lordship and he has submitted his creation to his order. All things obey the commands of God. The water knows to go but so far and that's it that he is orderly in his rule and that he is the ruler of all realms and he is the sanctity of grace his voice commands respect and he is full of great immense strength power and influence he is like an eagle soars at great elevations never once descending To walk in the lowliness of sinfulness such as man does. And that his fine eyesight, his vision is infinite. He sees all things, knows all things, understands everything. And that he is able to look deep within the souls of men. Deeper than you have ever thought about looking into your own life. He is beyond that. Your life is an open book. 
There was a secular song years ago called, I really don't need no light to see through you. He is light. And his light is greater than the world's most powerful x-ray machines and MRIs and CAT scans. He could see things that doctors have never even considered seeing. His knowledge is beyond the world's most brilliant scientists and intellects. And his abilities and capabilities will blow our ever-loving minds. He is also fearless and tenacious in all of his ways. When you don't know your own identity in life or in the kingdom of Jesus Christ... You will always pattern yourselves after the lives of others and not know God's full intent for your life. God wants us all to know who we are in him and who he is in us. Now is the time to take your face and put your face in the face of God and allow him to shore you up. And show you who you are in him. I pray that this word has been a blessing unto your spirit man on today. And that God himself has blessed you tremendously. If he has and you like the word that God has given to us for the body of Christ. Consider subscribing to our channel. Telling your family members and friends that the word of the Lord is being preached and taught on social media through the person of Pastor William Whitfield of Faith, Hope, and Love Ministries and Retreat Services International. Tell them that the word of the Lord can be accessed 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. And our only desire is to lead people to Jesus Christ. The theme of our ministry is empowering people to be free by the word of the Lord. We bless you and pray you have a wonderful week in the Lord. God bless you. Until next time. We'd like to thank you for tuning in and watching our broadcasts on social media. If the word of the Lord has been a blessing unto you, consider writing in and letting us know how the Lord has blessed you. Even consider subscribing to our channel. We can be reached at fhlmrs12 at gmail.com. God bless you and have a wonderful week in the Lord.